Hello, I'm Christopher Johnson from Therion and you're watching Impact Channel. Hi everyone, our guest today is Christopher Jonsson from Therion. Hey, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And welcome to Hungary again. Thank you very much. How do you like this European tour so far? This tour, um, it's the third tour we do uh, without a new record. So it's quite amazing that people still come to see us, if you ask me. <laughs> um, I was quite puzzled when we got uh, the offer to do another tour. I was like, uh, okay, we don't have a new record, but they were like, oh, it's going to be fine. So we got offered the same cash as if we have a new record. So yeah, okay, let's do it, you know, um, and it's been very good mostly, very good shows, some smaller shows as well, um, played a couple of cities we never played live, uh, where we never played before, um, and some cities we haven't played in a very long time, like Rotterdam, which we haven't played in since 1992, um, but it's been fun, it's been good shows, and uh, it's a very strong package, you know, we have very good support acts, so I think everybody who bought a ticket get really a lot of value for the money and had a really good time. You even had a special performance at the wedding. How did this happen? Uh, it was a coincidence that, that these people um, asked me and we had a day off in the area where, mm -hmm. where they were living. <laughs> it was really um, a coincidence um, because normally it would be extremely expensive for somebody to make a, a private concert with a band. Mm -hmm. You have the same costs like a regular promoter except you don't sell tickets. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, we can do private shows, no problem. If you want us to play in your garden and you pay the same like a regular promoter, you put up a stage and we play in front of your new girlfriend, no problem. You, know, you, you get concert offers and the booking agent will accept them. But since we were already in, in the area, and we, so we didn't need any transport, we only did, uh, had a tour bus, so we didn't need any hotel or anything like that, no flights, no overweight, no nothing. Still expensive, but you know, less than half the price for a regular concert. We accepted the offer, and they could afford it, so everybody was happy. Um, and they, it was very professionally made. I mean, they had a, a a real venue. There was an auditorium there, with big stage, light. So it was like a regular concert with hundred people. Mm -hmm. Sounds they were, cool. They were most of them of their friends. There were metal fans and liked the band. So it was like a regular concert in, in many ways. You recently posted a few pictures of the uh, food you had on tour. Some of them were pretty bad, you said. What was the worst food you ever had on tour? Boiled cucumber in Italy, 1996. Regular cucumber, sliced, put into water and boiled and then served. I don't know why they needed to boil the cucumber, uh, but to serve only cucumber as food is kind of shameful anyway. But apparently that was their view on uh, vegetarian food. <laughs> Uh, and it was unedible, I mean it was like jellyfish. So that's, that's the worst food I've ever been served. And I was offered only rice, a bowl with rice and nothing else. Uh, in Russia once as well, that was maybe not the best. Which was kind of ironic because we, we sold out a venue with 2,000 people and the best they can order, the founder of the band, is a bowl of rice. <laughs> But I, I was very, very rude to them then, so they managed to solve something better. <laughs> it must be boring to hear this question over and over again, but I need to ask you about the next album. When can we expect it to be released? Next album? I don't know. The other side of the rainbow. Mm. Um, we're working on a rock opera. And uh, if I say Jesus Christ Superstar, you know that there's a studio version available as well, but most people relate to it as a, as a live event. Mm -hmm. There are hundreds of thousands of people probably over the years that have seen Jesus Christ Superstar live, but not that many on a, on a studio recording of it. And I think you should consider our rock opera the same way. There, there will be a, a studio recording, obviously, uh, which will interest our fans, but um, in a wider perspective, this will be a live performance. Uh, it's music theater, you know, it's like a yeah, th think Jesus Christ Superstar, but the Therian version. So what's the concept behind it? 
It's partly based on a, a Russian author called uh, Vladimir Solovyov, uh, who wrote a book called uh, A Tale of Antichrist. And uh, we took a lot of basics from there, but we have rewritten it. So you can't say that it's based on the book, but parts of it is based on the book, parts of it are inspired by the book, and other parts we've just put in the context ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, and we work together with a Swedish author for the libretto and uh, the dialogues and everything. Um, because we're very good at making the music, but this has to be something that your mother could go and appreciate as well. And she don't give a shit about the music, she wants to be entertained. Um, so it, it needs to be very good theatre as well. It needs to be a good story, uh, good dialogues. You know, because most of the people that will see it, they will not know the music. They will go there and see it for the first time when it's performed on stage. Instead of going to the cinema, it's just an evening of entertainment for them. So therefore the music needs to be very accessible, so they can understand it immediately, and the story needs to be really, really good. Mm -hmm. Is it going to be in English or in Russian? Uh, English. It would be very limited to have it in Russian. Mm -hmm. So we will do it in English and uh, I guess we'll, we're going to try to work on some subtitling like to do at operas, mm -hmm. you know, so that you can have subtitles in yeah, basically any language. And what is it like to be on tour in Europe at the moment after what happened in France? It doesn't make a difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a, a terrible tragedy, but I mean, people say like, oh, do you dare to go to Paris and play again? But I don't think if it happens again, it will not be at a metal show and it's definitely not going to be in Paris. I mean, they have martial law in, in, in Paris now, that means you have military everywhere. And it would be the most stupid place ever to, to try something like that again. I, I think it's rather big a risk for London or some other big city, Vienna or Berlin or something, I don't know, Stockholm maybe. And of course it, it touches you in, in, a, in a different way. Uh, when you have such a, a terrorist attack in a metal concert because you played in this venue and you probably have common fans maybe some fan that you took a photo with was killed you know it, of course it touches you more than when you see something on the news like oh bomb in Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso you know it's very of course their lives are just as much worth, but it feels more unreal. You know, you're so used with the news feed, like you have the earthquake there, thousands of people dead, war there, thousands of people dead. You know, it, it, you're fed with so much bad news that you, you don't react after a while. It's just unreal. But when something happened at the place where you have been, where you, you know the people who work there, and you know, it, of course, you feel different about it. Um, but other than that, you know. It's business as usual, you shouldn't let people win by taking something from you. If people start getting scared or uncomfortable with it, then, then you let those Islamists win. Mm -hmm. What do you think about this whole mass migration thing that we are facing with at the moment in Europe? Personally, I am very thankful to, to Orban for his politics, trying to uphold uh, uh, EU policy. I mean, you have rules with Schengen that you should uh, defend the outer borders and then when Orban is doing what he's supposed to do, the, the other countries start criticizing. I mean, it's disgusting double moral and you can see what happened in Sweden when there was uh, um, a lot of talks about the mass immigration because we had 164,000 uh, asylum seekers coming only this year mm. in a country with 9 million inhabitants. That's more than Germany per capita. Mm. Uh, and they said, oh, there's no, there's no ceiling, there's no limit, and everybody who say that there's a limit, they are just racist. Okay, and two months later, everything that the opposition said that was regarded as racist is all of a sudden, oh, now we're taking responsibility, shutting the border and everything. It's just a disgusting political play, you know. In one way, I'm, I'm not comfortable mixing up my role as, as an artist with politics, because I think culture should be for everybody. I don't like bands with a political profile, but this is so fucking stupid that I'm going to have a public opinion about it. I mean, it, it destroys the countries completely. Um, and I think Hungary, Slovakia and uh, Czech Republic, to a certain extent Poland has been the only countries with a bit of sense in this mess. So, yeah, I am fully support Orban. I, I don't know everything about your domestic politics, if he's good with taxes or this or that, but 
um, when it comes to EU politics, he's the best politician in Europe, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also think um, the media laws he did are very good because we have a big problem with media in Sweden. That they simply refuse to give correct facts. They don't do the journalism as it was intended to be. And uh, to clear up in this swamp of corrupt journalists is unfortunately necessary if you're going to have a, a neutral news basis. You know, they try to, of course, twist it internationally, like, oh, Orban is re removing his uh, political opponents. And I'm sure there are political opponents among those people, but that's not the point. The point is that they are corrupt journalists. They didn't do their job. And we have the same problem in Sweden. That's why I have understanding for this, that you have public service paid with tax money and they are, they're not neutral. I heard about the scandal that the police didn't report about the, um, the rape or the just sexual harassment that happened in Sweden last thing last year, maybe. Exactly, but th that's what the propaganda from the media. Mm -hmm. uh, the media covered it up and now they blame it on the police. Mm -hmm. That's how bad it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, you know, alternative media who revealed this because you had police, you had a, a psychologist who, who worked with the victims, who tried to put this to media, and media, as soon as they heard that they were asylum seekers who did it, uh, over 200 people were arrested, and they were all from Afghanistan and Iraq and so on, then they were not interested in reporting it, because it could create racism. That's more important than upholding order or the victims or anything. So, yeah. That, that's why you had this situation, and this is exactly what I mean with um, what Orban did with the, the media, that you need to have certain laws, certain ethics in, in media. Um, the media shouldn't be allowed to, to steer the whole conversation, and I mean, they should criticize the power. They should um, check that the, the people in power are not corrupt, that they don't take bad decisions, and so on. So if you're a politician, you have to be able to take quite a lot from the media, that's correct. But when the media puts the agenda and the politicians has to follow the media because they're afraid of them, then you have a serious democratic problem. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. And what is the situation like in Sweden at the moment and how do you see your country's position in Europe, uh, European Union, I mean? Uh, I don't want to get into details, but the short version is I see Sweden as totally fucked. It's a sinking ship. Mm. And look at Argentina, our guitar players from Argentina. Uh, around the year 1900, they were the fifth strongest industrial nation on the planet. Mm. They had social benefits that we could only dream of in Europe, and they were like a, a Switzerland in South America. Yeah? And uh, they managed to completely screw that up. So bad that they went into military dictatorship. And if you go there today, it's very hard to believe that this once was a very prosperous and rich country. Mm. Um, in Sweden, people are I would say 75% of the Swedish people are quite dumb. You know? They think that money grows on trees and war and bad things. That happens on TV, you know. It never happens here. Sweden didn't have war in over 200 years. So therefore, um, they think nothing can happen here. Um, and the welfare society we have is falling apart totally. I mean, if you look to schools, you look to Medicare, it's a joke compared to it was when I grew up. The only thing that gets higher is the taxes more and more for worse and worse service um, and well it's, it's simply going the wrong direction and uh, I'm very very pessimistic here. but fortunately I have a job that I can live anywhere so at some point I will probably ask myself why should I pay the highest taxes on the planet if I can move to another country and you know if I would move to Russia or Romania I could live in a castle and have servants with the same money so uh, pessimistic but I live in the countryside in the middle of nowhere uh, it's very safe there and it's still quite acceptable in terms of welfare standard but in the cities it just gets worse and worse but I, I don't feel any sympathy I mean people vote as they like they voted for this so if they vote for shit they get shit so who am I to complain I I will be among the little part of society which will be privileged I can buy my son a private school. I can buy myself private Medicare. Um, I can buy myself a, a gated community. You know? So I will have a good life, but the people who voted for this and now they get shit, you know, they may not be in the same 
economic and, and uh, work position like me, so mm -hmm. that's their problem. Some people visualize the end of the European Union in the near future. What do you think? Could it be happen? For sure. I mean, uh, when you speak about the monetary union, for instance, with the Euro, uh, we had a monetary union in uh, Scandinavia before. That's why we have a Swedish crown, Norwegian crown, and a Danish, Danish crown. And uh, when the First World War broke out, um, the economies were going in different phases, so we had to break it up. Um, and none of the countries were in the Second World War. It's just because how we get affected by the First World War around us. Um, and I think we have much bigger problems now with economies going different. You can see Ireland had a problem because their economy was going too good. You know, their, their economy was being overheated. And since they could not use the monetary instruments of uh, raising the interest, for instance, uh, and adjusting their currency to others, they get overheated and they get uh, problems with many things. And of course, they had the, the subprime bubble, for instance, and a lot of other things. Um, but if you if you compare Ireland when they were going really well and, and Greece, you know, you see that they cannot be in the same monetary union with one common. Uh, central bank setting the interest level for everybody it, it's not economically sustainable mm -hmm. um, you need to have financial instruments so you can uh, adjust uh, when your employment is higher or lower or if your export or import ratio is, is changing or whatever mm -hmm. especially if you live in a country that doesn't have natural resources like um, take a country like Russia most of their uh, incomes come from exporting oil and, and uh, nature gas and they also have other mining things. Of course they get affected by uh, the world prices of those but people drive their cars, they consume the same things. You know, it's And the industry uses a lot of oil and so on and people use gas to heat their houses in Eastern Europe or for kitchen or whatever. Uh, and you produce electricity with, with gas turbines a lot in East Europe. So this is kind of foreseeable. You understand how much they're going to need. It's, you won't get any drastic changes. You, you can have world price go up and down, but it's only one thing to adjust to. But when everything changes in your country, like you manufacture something that nobody needs anymore or something, then you need com completely to, to restructure your economy. And it's very difficult when you're in the EU, I think, or when you're in the, in the monetary union. And another problematic thing is that EU law is over uh, the national law. And if you will have an example now of uh, uh, the EU forcing Eastern European countries to take refugees, you will have a very demonstrative example of that. But people mm -hmm. will see, we don't want this, the EU make us do this. Mm -hmm. It's something more in the face to people than if they say, okay, uh, an apple need to be this big to be called an apple. You know, like when we joined the EU, there was this discussion about our, we call it Christmas apples, and they were too small to mm -hmm. be called an apple. So they had to be called something else. But that doesn't make a big difference to people. But if you all of a sudden get 100,000 refugees that you have to take care of with your tax money and they will live in your city and you get problems like in Cologne and, and so on, then it will be on a completely different level to people. If, if they raise your taxes so you can afford it, and if you get social and, un, unrest because of it. Mm -hmm. um, so that could definitely be, that, that could definitely be something um, that makes some Eastern European countries consider their membership. And England, which is, oh, the UK, which is already on the verge of mm -hmm. having a uh, referendum about it, they will probably not become more positive either. Mm -hmm. So, historically speaking, everything speaks against the union being stable mm -hmm. longer terms. And would you participate in a party or in any movement if uh, the ideology and uh, the, the direction is acceptable for you? Uh, I was politically active before, but I'm not anymore. Um, I think when, when you have a political party, it's a whole package of ideas, and there's always ideas that you don't agree with. There's nobody that have a package ideologically which is 100% new. So you have to choose the package which is least shitty. You know? uh, I'm a very un-ideological person. I have opinion about different questions, but I, I don't like ideology. It's like religion to me. I don't like the big package. I, I engage myself for for 
a while in Sweden and yeah, did something so I can look my son in the eyes. So when, when he will ask me when he's older, like, how could you fuck up the best welfare nation on the planet? And I can say, well, at least I did something. Instead of saying, oh, I don't know, I was so busy being a rock star and drinking my expensive cognac in my big villa, so I just didn't have time to bother. So I did a lot of, you know, volunteer work that you would expect somebody in my position to do. You know, and, uh, actually, I helped them to make a lawsuit against uh, the city that refused to pay out money to them who were entitled to. I took it to the highest court and won. So I, I did my part. But now I just feel like it's so fucked up anyway that I don't think it's going to be done properly. So I just look after my own house. And I live in a safe area where things are still kind of organized and if I get fed up with Sweden I just say goodbye to the sinking ship leave just before the rats do you know